Okay. Thank you, Aaron. All yours. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation, and uh, it's uh, it's quite a day uh, for you guys, especially those of you in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, the um, yeah. So well, if you have a, a choice between listening to this talk or voting, please vote. Uh, otherwise, uh, let's let's get started. So. Uh, the title of my talk uh, is Emerging and Preserving Compositional Structure Through Iterated Learning. Um, so iterated, iterated learning is one of these things that I've become quite interested in lately. Uh, and today, I think I'm going to talk about two of our projects uh, that we've recently done in this area. And I'm, I'm, my goal in giving you this talk is to try to get you excited about the potential of, of this kind of method and, and to uh, and to try to get you interested in looking into it because uh, it's still somewhat mysterious to me. So uh, it'd be fun to see uh, more people paying attention to it. Oh, all right. So um, to get started, I think I'll just offer a, a kind of a hand wavy definition. This is, this is gonna be the subject matter of the thing that I'm gonna mostly focus on here today, uh, systematic generalization. So what I mean by systematic generalization is generalization to examples that may not be drawn from the same distribution as the training set, uh, but that obeys what I call the same basic rules of production. So what I mean by this is we're interested in out of distribution generalization here, but not just any kind of out of distribution generalization. We're, we're, we're trying to imagine that while the, while the test scenario or test context is, is going to be perhaps different from the training context, the underlying semantics are shared, right? And I think you'll, you'll see what I mean as, as we move along um, with the talk. So uh, yeah, so just a plot here shows the, kind of a, the difference between these two. Uh, can you guys see my cursor, if I, my pointer? Yeah, okay, great. So by semantic generalization, we're imagining two distinct distributions between the training distribution and the test distribution. Uh, but they share some semantics or some rules of production, let's say, between them. Uh, so I was very much inspired to go down this path by the work of Lake and Baroni, uh, who were themselves influenced uh, by Fodor and his er much earlier work. Um, so they wrote this paper, Generalization Without Systematicity, um, where they're really interested in this notion of compositionality as the basis of getting to something like systematic generalization. So in their case, they're considering mostly language. And in my talk, I'm actually gonna be following that perspective of considering mostly language-like data. Um, but I think it's important for you guys to know that this, these kinds of ideas are very much applicable to all kinds of different modalities, vision and all kinds of other things. So, so do keep that in mind. I'm, I'm not necessarily a, a natural language processing person. I'm, I'm a machine learning person. Uh, we're just playing around with these tools in the context of, uh, of NLP tasks and, and NLP related tasks for now. So uh, they, know, they developed this notion of systematic compositionality, which is just the capacity to understand and produce an infinite number of novel combinations from known components. So this is a mechanism by which humans uh, generalize in some sense effortlessly, right? Like we do this with natural language. For example, uh, if you consider that you've just learned the meaning of a new verb to DAX, then you have no trouble to understand the meaning of DAX twice and then DAX again. So this is the kind of compositional structure that you can exploit in order to generalize to a, to a sentence that very likely you've never seen before. And as I, as I say, humans do this effortlessly. Machines, there's a question, do they demonstrate this kind of compositional generalization? And in fact, that is the question that Lake and Baroni were asking um, in this work. And you can maybe tell from the title that the answer that they find is that no, not really. In fact, they don't. So they're set up here just to give you some, some context and some grounding in the kinds of things we're talking about is, uh, is uh, using this scan data set, right? So what it looks like are very much things along these lines, right? So you have natural language or, or natural language-like instructions over here. So jump, translates to the action jump. So you can think of this a bit like a, a, a translation task, but really it's, it's you can think of it also like a, an instruction and then an action sequence. So jump left, we go, uh, yeah, jump left, then we have do a left turn, jump, et cetera, et cetera. So as you go down, you know, jump, turn left twice, it goes turn left, turn left. So it's translating a, a natural language sequence into a sequence of, of actions. 
And the question they want to set up is just in doing those kinds of tasks, are they able to demonstrate this kind of uh, systematic generalization through compositional structure? Are these models able to exploit this compositional structure? And the kinds of models they're interested in at the time were, you know, the sort of still the workhorse, they're slowly being taken over by things like transformers. Uh, but th what they worked on are these seek to seek models. So basically LSTMs on this kind of translation task, right? So it's a standard seek to seek where the sequence coming in is the natural language sequence. Then you have a, an end of sequence tag. And then the output here is the sequence of actions. And so in particular, the way they're going to study systematic generalization in this context is they're going to modify their training distribution to include for one action, and this is just one of the experiments they've done, but it's the, the one I want to focus on here. For one of the actions they've done, uh, for example, they use jump in this case, they're only going to train on the primitive, meaning jump itself, and a few composed commands. Uh, whereas for all other actions, like they have a, a few other primitives like run and walk, they're going to use they're going to use those primitives in conjunction with all of the other possible uh, composed commands. So they've got, for example, run, run twice, walk, walk opposite left, and run twice, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea, though, in the phase, in the testing phase here, is they're going to actually uh, for the primitive here, which is to say our jump command here, they're going to test on all of the thing, all of the composed commands that we're not seeing in the training phase, right? But this is just our, our DAX and, and DAX twice, right? It's just the case where if we understand how jump is used, and in this case, we're given evidence to suggest that jump is used in the same way walk is used, in the same way uh, run is used, if we're given that context of how to use jump, um, then we should be able to, to use that and the compositional structure that's available with all of these other actions in order to generalize to these new combinations that we've never seen before in training. Um, so this is the exploitation of compositionality that we're hoping to find. And what we see in their results is that, in fact, these models are quite poor at this. So what I'm showing you here on the right is uh, just this is the number of composed commands used for training. So they've got the, this primitive here, which we can imagine is this one here, and then they've added a uh, some extra co composed commands. And really, you know, in the extreme case of a model that has really truly mastered compositionality, it ought to go from just this case, uh, from just training on the primitive alone and generate 100% accuracy for all of, all of the, uh, the test uh, composed commands. But instead, we don't see that, right? We see a very slow climb up and you need quite a bit of diversity in the training set before you start generalizing effectively. Um, so, yeah, so so the you might you might you might ask that well or, or wonder that this might be true, but this is a very artificial setting. These models are, are you know a little bit off from state of the art right now, and this is a these data sets are in fact pretty artificial and pretty small. Maybe the same basic pattern of what we're finding doesn't actually hold in our larger set experiments. Um, to which I would just offer this point of knowledge. This is just a, just a random example, but it, it does suggest to me that we're actually do see this kind of problem in let's say larger scale settings. So this is a, a pre-trained language model. Uh, and some people have recently found that you can actually use these kinds of pre-trained models that are trained on, on billions of data examples, uh, billions of tokens on, from web data and that you can actually use them as, as a knowledge bases in this, in this very interesting way. So you can just compose sentences with some word masked out and it will actually resolve to the true word here. So we have, uh, say for example, uh, uh, Platonism is named after mask, right? And the true answer here is Plato. And the, the answers generated from the model are in fact, Plato is the top returning answer. So that's great. These models are actually able to do this kind of knowledge retrieval, it seems. Except when we start putting in uh, negation, this is a result, by the way, of, of Kastner and Schultz, uh, a very recent paper. We, what they've done is just modify these sentences. In the first case, just by adding a not. In the second case, by pre-sequencing the, the sentence with some keyword, in this case, Yokohama. And what they end up with is, you know, if the right answer to Paris Opa died in the city of, oh, sorry, Marcel Opa died in the city of Mask, and the true answer is Paris, which the, which the model gets. If we ask Marcel Opa did not die in the city of Mask, the answer the model returns is still Paris, right? 
So this, to me, I would suggest is evidence of the model, in fact, not being able to generalize compositionally or generalize systematically. It does not develop an, uh, an understanding of the meaning of, of not. And if it does develop that, it is not able to compose, put that in this novel sequence that's very likely never seen before and resolve some sort of truth value out of this that makes sense, right, for, for mask here. So, and by the way, if you have any questions as we go along, uh, please don't hesitate to, to speak up or to just put in the Zoom. I'm trying to keep an eye on it, but for the most part, I'm probably gonna fail at that. So anyway, um, right, so, so we can keep going. Uh, the same basic pattern essentially holds up here. Uh, same, same essentially thing that happens here that you can, and you can actually, oh, I forgot to mention, if you, if you preface this with this, this is kind of a, a priming keyword here, that's often what ends up getting uh, returned. Um, same thing here. In fact, in, this is one case where it actually does seem to return the correct answer. So Lexus is owned by Mask. Uh, in, in fact, gets the correct answer here. Toyota, Lexus is not owned by Mask. In fact, it doesn't actually return uh, Toyota as the first answer. I'm speculating that this isn't necessarily any evidence towards uh, compositional structure learning, but more this is just actually genuinely a case probably a question that was found in the data or much closer to a question that was found in the data set. Um, people will tend to, I think on the web, ask questions like, uh, or ask is Lexus owned by something? And, and then the answer being Lexus is not owned by say Ferrari, for example. Uh, I would imagine that's reasonable. I don't think anybody has probably ever written the sentence, Marcel, but did not die in the city of, of something, right? That's which is probably an unlikely sentence to exist. And that's why these are interesting from a systematic generalization point of view. Right, so what I'm showing you here, I think is just that, that we see these kinds of problems a lot and, and these models don't seem to be able to capture the kinds of compositional structure we would hope they would and that humans seem to. And so how can we get our models to generalize in this way, generalize systematically, capture the compositional structure that we're looking for in our models. Uh, well, one, one way of thinking about this, or, or one model family, let's say, that has um, come up that I think actually does sh share, does, does have quite a bit of potential, is what are known as neural modular networks. Um, this is a method really pioneered reasonably recently by uh, Jacob Andreas, who I believe is now at MIT. Um, and uh, these are really interesting models, although they do have their own challenges. So, so very briefly, and we'll return to these in a minute, but these are models that essentially are composed of little, in this case, neural nets in and of themselves, and you, you compose them together. So the structure of the model itself is compositional. And the hope would be that if given a new uh, task or a new question type, that you could actually compose these models together in a novel formulation, which would give you an answer that would allow you to do this kind of generalizations from their compositional structure itself. Um, there's some hope, we've actually done some work that suggests that these are, that there is some hope that these, are, these kinds of models are able to systematically generalize. On the other hand, there are actually real issues with, with how to generate those, those comp compositional architectures in of themselves. So we're going to return to this point a little bit. In fact, that's exactly one of the ways we're going to be looking at iterative learning to see if we can actually improve um, the compositional uh, generalization of these kinds of models. So you could argue that this, these kinds of neural modular networks are, are sort of of a piece with a, a broader family of, of strategies, which I'll call top-down solutions. So with top-down solutions, what I'm really getting at here is, is the idea that we are going to kind of impose strong priors for compositional structure in the representation or in the model itself. Um, I call these top-down solutions mostly because it's kind of, we're, we're imposing this, where we have some idea of what the compositional structure should be. And so we're gonna be imposing this from above. You can think of, or at least I think of things like uh, directed graphical models as, uh, as having that kind of strong prior imposition. Now, one issue we, we have with these models, if you can actually find the right model structure and, and manage to train them, they can be very successful, these sorts of strategies. But often we get the model structure a little bit wrong. And in, in those cases, it just becomes very, very difficult to implement these. We, I have students working in these, in sort of, let's say soft versions of this kind of structure to try to promote more compositional structure in, in things like LSTMs. Uh, and, in general, while we can make progress in that direction, I think um, it's, it's 
it's difficult to do because of the, the training challenges that, are, that arise when you're trying to impose these compositional structures, right? It's a bit like you have to get it just right in order for the model to fit properly. Um, so I've become, I've become pretty excited about an alternative way of thinking about how to impose this kind of uh, compositional structure. And that's what I would consider to be more like bottom-up solutions. And in particular, the one I'm thinking about is this iterated learning, uh, which is essentially a, a theory that comes from cognitive science about how language emerged in, well, just normal human language emerged through the process of, of you know, human evolution and development. And so what I think we'll do is just go over, you know, how the, the, the original idea of iterated learning and, uh, and then, uh, then we'll talk about how we can apply this in the context of, of machine learning methods. So, um, so the, the question they're trying to address here with, with iterated learning is, is just the following, like how did natural language emerge uh, in, in in reality and in, in true life, right, with, with, uh, with humans, you know, in the process of development. Um, and in particular, they're interested in studying this question of where does the regular compositional structure of language come from? So this is really the work of uh, Simon Kirby, by the way, and his colleagues. Uh, he's been publishing for the last uh, 20 some odd years on this topic. And um, one, one of the things he's been able to do is essentially uh, replicate his theory of how human language emerged in at least like how the compositional structure of human language emerged. He's been able to replicate it, these kinds of phenomena in the lab um, with, with human participants. And so you can think of this as like uh, language development under a microscope or language development in the lab. And we'll just go through this now to give you a sense of, of what um, iterated learning, how it works. And so uh, first, I guess, uh, yeah, so the, the theory of iterated learning is that the compositional structure of human language emerged through the successive relearning of language from generation to generation. So the iterative part in iterated learning is this notion that you're relearning from one generation to the next. So how does this work? Well, let's imagine that we have a simple uh, setup where we have like a few objects here. So each these objects have a, a few different features, right? So hence they're underlining compositional structures. So there are two shapes, circles and triangles, two distinct colors. There's the black color and then there's this dark blue color and two distinct uh, patterns of motion. There's this wavy pattern of motion and then there's a circular pattern of motion. And what we do is we start with uh, an initial set of, of words that refer to each of these objects. And when this is the language zero because we just assign these random language, uh, language elements to this. So there's no structure to this. It's fully idiosyncratic language, just random words. Uh, so they're sort of in the space of pronounceable non-words, let's say. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a transmission set. So this is the transmission set zero uh, for the zeroth order iteration. But it's very importantly going to, going to be composed of only a subset of the objects in the original language. Right? And this is the, 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 the set of examples that we're going to give to our first participant to learn from. And so they're going to, this participant is going to get the set of examples and the set of, of words and, and objects, so paired examples, in which they're supposed to learn essentially the referring language um, to these objects. And, and then she's, the, this participant is going to then provide words as best she is able to all of the language components. And then we're going to select a subset of that for our next participant. Uh, but the key point about this is that this, this transmission set constitutes what we call a learning bottleneck, right? Either by limiting the number of examples, as you see here, or uh, more frequently in the context of machine learning applications that we'll see later, later limiting the amount of training we do on this transmission set. And that becomes a key component to how uh, iterated learning works. Anyway, so in this context, we're gonna do the same thing from the language generated by uh, this first participant to generate the second set of, of examples. We pass this to the second uh, participant. And then from there, we're going to go and do this over and over again, where each participant tries to expand the language out to cover the full range of objects that, that are in the, this, this small universe of objects. And then they're gonna transmit some subset of that knowledge to the next set. Uh, 
And what we see over the course of uh, multiple iterations, in this case 10, is that we end up with a language which is, in this case, in this example here, fully compositional, right? The first syllable, ne, here, refers to the color, right? Dark is ne, la is for blue. The second syllable refers to the Second syllable refers to the motion, no, sorry, refers to the shape. So the ho refers to the circle and the key refers to the triangle and the plo versus the pu uh, refers to the, the um, motion type, right? So what we started with is an entirely idiosyncratic language, random words associated to these different objects. And through the course of this iterated learning, we end up with a uh, fully compositional uh, language that we refer to in this context. Um, now, I think you might be wondering, well, maybe there's some bias towards this kind of compositional structure uh, for humans, a, a prior that underlies this structure. And in fact, there, to the extent that there is theory on iterated learning, this is essentially the direction the theory points to, is that what you're really doing is converging back to a prior um, in some sense. And I think in a case like this, when we're applying it to human data, I think that's a reasonable kind of uh, way of thinking about it. But when we see how we apply it in the context of, of neural networks, I think it becomes a lot more challenging to think about it from that point of view. Although I'd be open to, uh, to thinking about that some further. Okay, so the basic idea for us now is to, to think about how we can apply these, this iterated learning to um, cases where we're interested, right? For example, machine learning applications. And so there's actually been some work in this direction. More specifically, where what we've seen is they've applied iterated learning to uh, language emergence between AI agents. And this is, you can see this is all relatively recent work. Um, but they've largely been successful at, at emerging more compositional language when using iterated learning as opposed to when not using iterated learning. Um, but for us uh, in, in the rest of this talk is we're, we're going to be focusing on what you might argue is more traditional machine learning methods. I'm really interested not in how we can sort of just emulate what was done in humans, um, that being how we can we can emerge compositional language, but how can we exploit iterated learning as a proper learning mechanism all on its own to promote systematic generalization through this uh, capturing of compositional structure? And so we're going to see two examples, uh, if we get, have time for them. Uh, one is uh, applied to, as I mentioned before, neural, uh, neural modular networks for uh, a visual question answering setting. And here again, we're going to be focusing on a systematic generalization. And second one we're going to focus on is actually the application of iterated learning to counter language drift in dialogue models. That's a, what I would regard as a fairly surprising application of, of this kind of uh, method, uh, but we'll get there in a second. So for now, we're going to focus on the VQA application. And so the kind of data set we're looking at is, is relatively toy. We're still fairly much, if fairly, uh, yeah, we're still very much in toy settings with these kinds of studies. Uh, so we're using the clever data set here. So you can argue this is a visual reasoning task. It's an artificial task, but, but, the, but from a visual reasoning point of view, it's actually relatively sophisticated. So we, we have a collection of shapes uh, of different colors, different textures, different sizes. And we're, we're given a question that is generated synthetically by a, a, a series of question templates. For example, in this case, what number of cylinders are small purple things or yellow rubber things? And if you squint and think about it for a while, you'll come up with the answer that it is in fact two in this case. So Clever was generated some time ago, actually in 2017. And, and uh, I was involved in some of the earlier work in trying to you know, push the state of the art on this data set. And it was actually one of these examples where um, you know, 2017 was sort of the quite quite the fever pitch of research in this area, and it was actually we were able to achieve superior to, to human performance by the time the paper was presented at the conference. Uh, so from the time it was posted on archive to the time it was presented at the conference, we had essentially gotten to the, to to past uh, 
um, super well past human level performance on this task. Uh, so there's just you know paper after paper on this topic. Uh, for our purposes here, um, we're not so much interested in pushing the state of the art. What we are interested in doing is looking at again this kind of systematic generalization, and I'll get into a bit how we do that in the context of clever. Uh, but before we do that, we'll consider an even simpler case, which is the shapes data set. So uh, same basic concept, we have question templates. In this case, the shapes has just 12 question templates. What we've done um, in, in the, our own work here is we've developed this, what we call shapes cisgen T, uh, or cisget if you like, uh, which is a, a split of the shapes question templates uh, designed to probe this question of systematic generalization. So there were 12 question templates in the original shape. So we've taken some of, of them and used those as uh, uh, to train on. And then we've kept five of these question templates to be completely independent and those we'll test on. So for an example, uh, here's, here's just an example. So, um, so in the train, train set for a case like this, where you know the shapes are actually visually much, much simpler than we see with, uh, with Clever. Uh, is a red shape above a green shape. And then we could have a question in the train set that is a circle left of below a square. And then in the eval set, we, we see a combination that's unique and has never been seen in the training set before. Is a red shape left of below a green shape? Okay, so the idea here is again that the elements are all in the original uh, training set, but with novel combinations. So if the model is able to capture the underlying um, uh, compositional structure, it's going to be able to answer these questions in the generalization set or in the in the um, in our systematic generalization set. Okay, so let's continue. So we're gonna. I mentioned earlier that we're going to um, uh, talk about neural modular networks. Uh, so this is basically just a refresher for those of you who've not seen this. I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail on them, but I will give you enough of a highlight view, I hope, that you're able to sort of like get the idea. So this is a case where we apply it to Clever here. So the, the basic idea of the uh, of uh, these neural modular networks is that you have a what's called a program generator here. So that takes in a question and generates essentially a program that tells you in, in the kind of, in this case, it's a seek to seek model, right? And that program that's generated tells you how to assemble your modules. And the modules here are these, these little green boxes inside the, this bigger green box called the execution engine. And so we've got a little neural network whose job it is here, for example, just to filter the color yellow in this case. And another little network here just to filter the shape uh, cube and then the, another neural network that's job it is, is to take the input of this one or any one, right? You could, and so you can see here that this count module is actually being used twice in this context. And then you have another module that does great, that you know, compares between the two and asks the question, is the, this one perhaps greater than that one? And then you get an answer. So you can see the power of these modules that if you're able to generate these programs correctly, and if you're able to train these modules properly, and by the way, how we train these modules is quite clever. What we do is we just, in the assembly of these module types here, we just then simply train on backprop because we assume that we have actually a labeled answer in this case with, with the, the input image. So we just train with standard backprop. So all of the modules end up being trained through back, backprop presumably in many novel configurations. But through the, through the course of being in all of these unique configurations, they can train to be sort of just do what they want to do as a module. So for example, this one truly does just learn to filter shape cube. Now there's a lot of details that come in, which, is, um, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, that, that come into like exactly how are we going to parameterize these little neural networks. And uh, I think the question isn't really settled on what is the most effective way to do that. So we're going to be comparing a number of these models, uh, but I'm not going to really go into the details of them at all. Just suffice to say that there are different kinds of, oops, there are different kinds of modules here. And so uh, as I mentioned earlier, we actually have some work uh, on, on what we call the scoop data set that show that these kinds of um, neural modular networks are actually really well suited for systematic generalization, provided that we actually know the correct uh, structure to the question that corresponds to the question. If we don't know that structure, it becomes quite a problem. So that is in fact where we're going to focus our energy is in, is in 
is in this program generator. We're going to use iterated learning here. Okay, so uh, here's a here's a another sort of diagram of how we're going to apply these neural modular networks. For example, in the case of the uh, shapes data set, a little more detail in this case. So we have our question: Is a green shape left of a square? We have our, our program generator, which is again this this bidirectional uh, LSTM in this case. Um, oh, actually, the model is a little bit different here. It's not just a straight. Uh, this is just a side thing, not really crucial for us, but this isn't, in this case, it's not just a straight seek to seek model. We're actually using a decoder with attention. So I don't know if you know of, uh, like this is essentially the precursor model to um, the transformer model, for example. This was developed by uh, um, Dima Barano, actually in Mila. Um, and for a while it was like the standard uh, translation model, uh, but it has since been surpassed by things like transformer based models. Um, okay, so the idea here is that we're gonna get a question we need to translate. Hello? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Okay. So, yeah. Is there a question or is that just an <laughs> expression of something? I think somebody left there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. So we have a. Actually, maybe, I don't know if, if now is a good time to pause if there are questions. Uh, probably now is not the most natural time to pause, but if there happen to be questions. Questions, you can unmute yourself and ask. If not, I can okay. continue. I think, I think people are good right now. Sure, yeah. Uh, so as I was saying, the, so the, we have this question here. We pass this through our program generator. And the idea is the program generator is to generate this program, right? In a case like when we apply this to Clever or Shapes, that's not so bad um, because we actually know the, the ground truth program here, right? Because it was actually the, the, the program that gave rise to the, you know, we, we, can, we can actually generate the program at the same time that we synthetically generate the image and the question. Um, but in any real application of these neural modular networks, uh, we're not going to, we can't assume that we know those programs, or at least we can't assume that we know a lot of them. We can maybe think about going in by hand and, 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 you know, doing some small subset of these, but we can't assume that we have all 700,000, for example, for Clever. Um, that's wildly unrealistic. And so the key point is, is how well can we do um, at, at learning these kinds of models without knowing, the, without having very many of these um, programs. Um, Right, and so just so, so we're clear, th this program actually defines this architectural arrangement of these modules inside the, again, the execution engine here. So these, so we take our image, we, we do some feature extraction in, into the scene, and then we, we apply these modules in an architecture specified by the program, and we get out our answer, right? But again, so what we're gonna focus on is exactly this set here, right? Because this is the place where we hope to be able to learn with very few of these examples. And right now, the best te technology we have is basically just to do you know, reinforcement learning on, on these things, because they're discrete. The output here is discrete. It has to be in order to form these, these, uh, these architectural structures. At least if you, well, you can think about how to do that in a soft way. Um, but for the most part, people have tried just doing RL, um, like using reinforce, for example, to train this model. And it's been difficult to do very well with that. So that is going to be our target for um, iterated learning. And again, this is just the note that I mentioned already, which is under the hood, there are lots of details, which I'm kind of ignoring, uh, which are actually um, in, in our paper, which is under submission, uh, where we present this work. Uh, which are uh, different forms of these boxes here, right? Whether we're using what's called a tensor NMN, a tensor film NMN, or a vector NMN. These are all things that some of these exist in the literature. Some of them we've actually sort of made up of slight modifications of what's in the literature. Um, I'm not going to get into those kinds of details here, but just suffice to say the actual technical uh, mathematical form of these modules is still somewhat up in the air. But for our purposes, we can kind of rise above that and just ask the questions very specifically of what is the role of iterated learning in, in helping these models generalize? So Wait, um, I have a question. 
Uh, so when you're training these networks, do you train each of them independently for their specific task and then stitch them together and train end to end? Or do you train everything end to end? Right. Good question. Thanks. Yeah. So we, that's one of the things I really like about these neural modular networks is you, you, you always train them end to end, but you can imagine that there, that each module will see a whole host of contexts, right? It'll be in not a bunch of different configurations. And so the idea is anyway, is that they will learn to, to be general purpose uh, modules by uh, virtue of finding themselves in a bunch of these different contexts, right? So this green module here, which is essentially just filtering out green objects is going to learn to be green, a green filter by virtue of always being placed here in a context where it needs to filter out something green to get the right answer. So assuming you have the right modules, uh, the, the right program structure, these modules, the idea is anyway, will learn to um, be uh, uh, sort of general purpose modules. Now, through other work that we've done, that doesn't actually seem to always hold. Unfortunately, there seems to be a gap in the sense that these models, these modules can over specify um, and, and, and can demonstrate a, what we call a systematic generalization gap, let's say, to novel configurations that they've never been trained on. That's possible. But for the most part, they actually do generalize fairly well. So it's a bit of a mixed bag um, on that result. But does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And a uh, follow-up question. Yeah. Ha have, you, have you used these modules in some other task, just as an ablation study, to see how well they generalize or or, or so, what, what are they actually learning? Because perhaps they could be learning something different that you were designing it for, and they became right. good for something else. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I, so like I said, we, we've done a little bit of that in a different context that I'm not gonna get into here. Uh, from what we've seen, they don't actually do as quite as advertised. I was mentioning that earlier that they, that they're not they are sort of specifying to something that isn't quite what you would hope they would. Um, but there is, we also have evidence um, on the flip side is that they're at, they're at least doing something reasonably close to, to that. I don't know if you'd call it an ablative study. We, we certainly haven't, I personally haven't kind of gone in to check exactly what they've done. I think other people have when they first, the earlier papers publishing this, I think they did do some uh, sort of investigative work to see what each of these are actually doing. Um, but I, couldn't remember those details for you right now. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Um, right, so we're gonna focus on uh, iterated learning for these program generations. Um, so again, we're just gonna be looking at this part of the model. And so the idea is we're, we want to learn, we're gonna, we found that we actually need a, a small number of ground truth programs. So that's our goal is we're gonna try to use a very small number of ground truth programs. Ordinarily, uh, you know, before we apply these kinds of iterated learning methods, this was a, was a pretty significant challenge to learn these, these kinds of structures without iterated learning. So we're gonna see if we can use iterated learning to help um, with that process. And so you can see that we're, we're, you know, this is not exactly natural language, but it is, it should share kind of a compositional structure. So we're hoping that we can use this iterated learning to emerge a compositional structure in these programs using only, you know, a, a, again, a very small number of ground truth programs to initialize the model. All right, so how are we going to do this? How are we going to uh, apply iterated learning? Well, we saw that this iterated learning, and you can tell from the name that it's a multi-step process. So I'm just going to take you through the steps we use to train this thing. So the first thing we do is just interactive training, right? So this, this is essentially like our, our participant that's learning to use um, words to associate with all of the all of the uh, elements in the object, or oh, sorry, all of the objects in the set, right? So this is just training both the execution engine here and the program generator here, um, just with standard backprop. And of course, we this, since this Z prime, this is our program, this is discrete, so we're actually gonna be training with, with reinforce through that, right? So we have Q, which is our question, goes input to our program generator, outputs our, um, our architecture or our program that specifies the modules inside our execution engine, the, in, the input image comes in here, outputs our classification, and we're, we train this thing essentially through backprop with 
uh, reinforce here from the, the question answer. All right, so that's, uh, we're gonna start with that kind of, that phase of training. Then, you know, we're gonna apply our, our information bottleneck. To do that, we need to collect data. So we're gonna take our, our program generator at this ge generation, at this sequence, or this iteration, and we're gonna just generate input output pairs and create a data set that way, right? So question input, that's given as part of the training set. We're gonna generate our program output and that, that's gonna become the target for our next phase, which is the super supervised learning of the program generator. So here we're training this new program generator on data here, and it's uh, and we're doing this in a in a in a in this training bottleneck, or this is the learning bottleneck that we saw with iterated learning. So uh, we take the data that we collected over here, and we're training on it. So so this is a newly initialized program generator here, and we're just training it on the previous generation's data. So you could you know, it's kind of natural to think, well, what have you gained? You're just taking some model that maybe wasn't so good to start with, generating data with that model, and now you're training on that data. What have you really gained? This is just gonna be as bad as the original data. The key here is that we're actually limiting the amount of training this model does through this training bottleneck. And that's gonna have a pretty big effect actually, surprisingly. And so, yeah, so now we take that supervised training uh, that new uh, program generator, we actually freeze that for a little while while we train up a new execution engine. We found this step, this is a bit of a variant compared to the standard uh, application of iterated learning, but we found this to be necessary in our context here. So, so we sort of leave this fixed for a little bit while we train this guy up a little bit. And then we just continue on with, with uh, interactive training with reinforce for a little while before starting that whole process over again. And we just iterate this process multiple times Right. Okay, let's see how we're doing. And realizing we're running pretty low on time, so I'm going to have to cut the short a little bit. Um, but on the shapes data set, this is the kind of thing we see. So again, what I really want you to focus in is on this plus IL, right? This means pl oops, plus iterated learning versus the models without iterated learning. And so what we we're doing the same models, like so. So this dark red and dark green are the same models. One is trained with iterated learning, and you can see this. This bumpiness here is actually the sort of what looks like instability in training. That's actually the iteration cycle. So we're iterating this process quite a number of times, right? And we're, what we're showing you here is actually the whole iteration cycle. And the first thing I want you to see is that if we look at program accuracy here, and this is a case where we're trained on, I don't remember how many, how many um, ground truth programs we used here, but it could be something like 20 ground truth programs we initialize the model with. And we can see that using iterated learning, our accuracy, which means the programs we end up generating compared to the ground truth accuracy is quite a bit better with iterated learning than without. So it's a pretty dramatic difference. And that translates to small benefits in, in actual accuracy when you compare it to the in distribution. But when we look at out of distribution validation, so these are with our, 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 SIG, our SIGET data set, right? Which where we train on some of the question templates and validate on the others, we actually see a pretty significant improvement uh, for the case where we have um, uh, iterated learning, at least in this context here. Right. So in, in, yeah, so with a small number of ground truth programs, that's what this GT here. So this is 20 ground truth programs. This is 135 ground truth programs. So that's quite a few. Um, in, when there's a small number of ground truth programs, we actually see a gain across the board for iterated learning. And in, in this model, in this variant of it, it actually seems very, very effective at, at, at improving uh, generalization in this context. All right, so we can apply the same thing to Clever, and we actually see that IID, meaning just when we train on Clever and test on Clever, we actually, with these program accuracies, and now we're using, in the context of Clever, just 100 ground truth programs, right? So there, this data set has actually something like 700,000 examples. So the original uh, and uh, um, neural module network papers were, at least the ones that performed very well, we're trained with all 700,000 ground truth programs. Here we're just showing how well they can do when you train with just 100 ground truth programs uh, with these specific model types. And what we're seeing is for accuracy, again, iterated learning seems to help quite a bit in terms of program accuracy. And it translates to some benefit for, um, for test accuracy, 
although it's really hard to tell that. And it does seem like if we actually extended training out further that this would actually probably disappear as, as very significant. But of course, our goal here isn't actually to test in distribution uh, performance. Our goal is we hope to leverage the fact that we're getting much better performance on ground truth programs to see how we generalize systematically. And for that, what we actually use is something else that uh, Dima Badenow found, which was that he actually identified seven question templates, which could be part of Clever in the sense that it's made up of elements that are all um, in Clever, right? All of all sort of basic um, uh, expressions that are in Clever, but their combination for whatever reason had been excluded from the original question templates of Clever. So there were seven of these, and this is an example of one of those down here. So he's, it's, you, he's effectively combining the templates from these two, which were in the original training set for Clever, and in this case here. So this constitutes a nice systematic generalization test set for the Clever training set, because this is a unique combination of elements, all of which are in the original training set. So that's, we call this the closure data set. And you can see that in that context, we actually do again see a significant benefit, particularly in the case of this tensor NMN. This vector NMN was a model that we, we pre, that um, he actually, um, that, that uh, Dima introduced with the closure data set in, in, in an effort to actually um, do better, but we actually get all round better performance with the original tensor NMN context, but with iterated learning. And you can see there's quite a gap between the two. And these are the seven closure templates. The, the names probably won't mean much to you, but they're sort of an indicator of the specific patterns that are being combined here. And again, these are all models that are just trained with the initial uh, 100 ground truth programs. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and steam ahead because we are running out of time. Um, I'm looking at, uh, in this case, we're gonna now apply these ideas of iterated learning to uh, counter language drift in dialogue models. So I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this deal or no deal paper. Uh, it made quite a splash a few years ago uh, in 2017. Um, what they did was they had two agents that were, were trained to kind of negotiate amongst themselves. They all had different values. They all value different objects differently. So the kinds of objects that we're dealing with here are kind of these, they had books, they had hats, and they had balls. And I think that actually might be about it. And, and they have them in different number. And the idea is you sort of exchange, or you have to divvy them up. That's right. I'm sorry. You have to, you get a pile of these and they have to divvy up the objects amongst themselves and according to their own personal values, which is going to differ between the agents in order to sort of do the best they can do. And so they kind of have to work together in order to divvy up the objects. And so the kind of the optimal solution here is to, is to communicate a deal on how to divvy them up so that they both are better off given their own value. Um, and if they both, if they can't agree, nobody gets any objects. And so that's sort of a, a cooperative competitive setting. It's a really nice setting. And what they did is they sort of did some crowdsourcing to get an initial data set in which they sort of pre-trained their model on. So they did it kind of an imitation learning setup where they first trained that model. And then what they did is something quite natural is they said, well, we have these agents, we're just gonna have them play against each other and, and, and you know, in this, in this dialogue context, using the natural language that they, they mined from their, from their users in the, in the crowdsourcing setup, uh, using RL to try to get them better at this task, even better than the humans that were playing uh, and from which they crowdsourced. And what they found was that these agents, while eventually performing better than at this task than, than the humans and the, certainly better than the original agents, they rather quickly started evolving different language. So we call this language drift. And because these two agents, when talking back and forth in a training context, there's nothing to really ground them in natural language, or at least not initially. So the question is, how do we actually do that? How do we actually recover uh, this, this grounding in, in this language drift uh, to avoid this language drift? Uh, and so actually, this, this thing had quite an quite a impact in the sense that uh, there was uh, quite a bit of uh, media coverage of this, of this fact that these agents created their own language that they were communicating back and forth. And it seemed quite sinister if you were reading the, the, the news uh, around this at the time. But of course, there's, there's really not much to this, right? This is just, uh, there's just a, a drift phenomenon that happens. 
they're performing better at the task, but there's really no a priori reason for these models to uh, to stick close to natural language if all they care about is performing better on the task. And of course, in their context, they they tried various things to keep the language um, to uh, their own uh, to, to to be as close to natural language as possible. Uh, so I'm going to skip this slide. This is just breaking down different types of drift that we've seen in different contexts in the literature. Generally speaking, what happens when you have these two agents playing against one another, and I think that's really the setting where, where it's most interesting, because there's really the setting where we have most opportunity to improve over just supervised learning, which is going to be very limiting. Um, so this is an important context, but what we see is they're, they end up doing very well at the task, but the language they get out is very poor. And so there are different kinds of strategies to, to um, counter this. Um, you can essentially do very specific things by constraining the language. If you know, if you have task knowledge and the ability, if your task is extremely constrained, then you could, you could probably limit the vocabulary and do things that otherwise control what the, how, how these agents can use the language and that can help. Or you can use what's called these population methods, or you can do something else, which is called uh, supervised self play. And this is actually probably the most popular method uh, even right now for doing this. So the idea here is they're just going to repeatedly inject in grounded language, which they collect from humans back into the learning process. So they're going to iterate between the self play where the agents are trying to get better at the task and then again, tr grounding themselves back in the original data. So they iterate and sometimes they mix these two together. So they're both trying to do well at the task through this self play scenario and to try to ground themselves in, in, in language. And eventually the idea would be to do well at the task and yet still communicate natural language in order to communicate with the human, which is after all the goal in these kinds of dialogue models. All right, so um, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm really running out of time here. So uh, I think what I'll do is the idea that we're, we that my student had was to try to, uh, apply iterated learning to counter this kind of language drift. So it's a very interesting idea. And it's one that it's a good example of the kind of thing where, you know, had had he come to me before he tried this, I would have probably try to convince him that it wasn't going to work. And the reason is, is because, well, it seems strange that it would work, right? I mean, you are essentially, and in fact, it's even hard to imagine that it would, but we'll see, we'll see how it works in a minute. But basically the idea would be, um, if in fact iterated learning is correct and that that and that natural language, our natural language, like for example, English in the context that we're looking at here have evolved to sort of be easy to learn. That's one way to say it, then we maybe we can exploit this phenomenon and use iterated learning to actually help counter language drift. So if you imagine we do a little bit of self play and we actually drift a little bit, then maybe going through something like this in this learning bottleneck will actually help counter that. And so this is what we came up with in the context. Uh, basically, we use what's called iterated seeded, uh, sorry, seeded iterated learning. And so we start with some pre-trained agent. So this is just an agent that's trained on some amount of, of natural language data in the context of a, of a dialogue task. And then we generate a, a student who's now going to do self-play interactive settings. And through that process, they're going to transition into the teacher. We're going to use that teacher to then generate data, as we've seen before with iterated learning. And then that data is going to be used to train in a supervised or in an imitation learning setup a new student. And that student is then going to become the offspring. So the seeded part of this iterated learning phenomenon comes in in that this student isn't completely new. It isn't just initialized from, from, uh, from random weights. It is actually a copy of this original student here before it got the interactive data. And so, and that process is continued on throughout, throughout. So what this allows us to do is be a little bit more efficient in this training process because we're not starting over from a, from a blank slate. In some cases, this helps in, in like, for example, in the case that we're looking at here. Um, but for our earlier study with uh, neural modular networks, we found that this wasn't actually helpful, that we needed to actually start with, uh, with a, an initial distribution here um, and not just seed it from, the, from the, uh, the previous student. But at any rate, then what we take is we take that uh, offspring, we iterate this process over and over again, and hence our iterated uh, learning mechanism.
All right. So the way we're, we're one of the places where we apply this is in uh, this translation game. So here we've got a uh, French language agent, uh, an agent that translates from French to English, and we have an agent that translates from English to, to German. And our goal is in this translation game is to imagine that what we want them to do is to work together to create a French to German translation model, right? And so we're going to initialize both of them with a little bit of data. And then, the, and then here, the English language transition data here now becomes our, our sort of what we're going to use for iterated learning. It's going to be kind of the, the hidden language that in a dialogue setting could potentially drift away from, from standard English uh, if we weren't doing something to oppose it. And so you can just think of what can go right and what can go wrong. Let's imagine we have this sentence like bonjour le monde, hello world, and that translates to hello wealth. This, in this case, we have no language shift because the English is good and high accuracy, meaning it's a good French to German translation. We can imagine low accuracy if there's a mistake in the, in the overall French to German translation. And we can imagine uh, language drift if inside we imagine there's drift that is that is then, so we end up with a bad translation from French to English, oops, which is then compensated for with the translation back to German here. All right, and finally, those things can obviously be combined so that we end up with both drift and low accuracy. So that's the, the setting where we're gonna be applying this iterated learning context. And so just to let you know about how we're gonna be evaluating this, so our task score, we're gonna be using uh, German blue score for task evaluation for that's to score the quality of the overall translation from French to German. And then we're gonna also use blue English score to evaluate language drift. We also can use uh, the, ne the negative log likelihood in English here and R1 because of the data we're using in this translation game actually comes from captions. So we can actually use the image retrieval as another mechanism to evaluate this. But we'll be focusing on mainly the German blue and the English blue here. All right, so what we see when we compare to a simple baseline, in this case, we're not trying to use any kind of other countering measure. Uh, we're just comparing to say just a, a standard Gumbel softmax for the translation through the English. And what we see is that um, our SIL, so our seated iterated learning, actually manages to do fairly well at the blue, but then again, everything does decently well at the score. The difference comes into what happens when you have um, on, the, on the language drift. So what we see is that our iterated learning, our seated iterated learning is actually able to maintain uh, the, the language score in English here. So it's not seeing much drift at all. Whereas our baselines uh, here uh, of, a, um, uh, of our Gumbel train models are actually deteriorating quite rapidly in terms of English blue score. So that there's quite a bit of drift happening in this case. Um, we can actually compare that to a model, uh, we can compare to this, the S2P, this is the model that we saw before. This is kind of the standard way right now, I think the dominant way to, to preserve language. And what we actually see is that S2P offers kind of this trade-off between either doing well at the task or doing well at language drift, uh, countering language drift, but it's difficult to sort of achieve a very good optimum between the two. And with uh, seated iterated learning, we're actually able to achieve a pretty happy medium between the two, both preserving um, English blue reasonably well and also doing very well with the task score. Uh, so we can, uh, you know, just to show you the kinds of sentences that we generate, you know, it's you just basically this just caches out to what we saw already with the with the quantitative results. It's essentially just pretty consistent with that that it essentially works. Um, so there's just, you know, wrapping up here, one interesting question is, if you really think about it, we went through this very quickly here, so it's going to be a little bit tricky to see that, but it's kind of surprising that the, the seated iterated learning or that iterated learning at all works in this language drift context, right? Because if you think about it, if we just back up a second and think about what, what we're doing with this, this model, this data that it's always generating on, it's being, sorry, it's always being trained on. It's just data that's spit out from the previous teacher. So it should be, it, it sh it's very difficult to understand why it isn't drifting since it's always just being retrained on something that was just trained through this interactive learning, right? It's, it's fair, well, at least to me, it's fairly counterintuitive that it should avoid language drift. 
And it really comes down to, we think, this learning bottleneck. So here's an example of what we mean by that. So again, this is, this is our setup, right? Our training setup. And we're always just training on this data set out here. And so the, but the, so the question is, in this, in what we're showing here is we're just looking at the, the negative log likelihood. So in this case, lower is better. And this is, we're, we're evaluating negative log likelihood of the, uh, under the model of, uh, tr of real data in this case. And so what we're seeing here is that after the model's been trained uh, on this data, so we're, we're comparing this teacher, then this student that's immediately after one cycle of training on this data. And what we see, and this is just showing the difference in NLL between these two, to see it better, is we're seeing a consistent improvement in natural language NLL from the student, from the teacher to the student, right? So this learning bottleneck, even at one step, seems to get us to a better model of natural language. That's what we're showing here. And so it's, it's a pretty interesting setup and it basically starts to suggest why this iterated learning might actually be helpful for pre preserving and uh, you know, this compositional structure and countering the language drift that we, we typically see. All right, so uh, in summary, uh, thanks for being patient uh, uh, the, and uh, allowing me to go a little bit over. Uh, so we have, uh, oops, we have uh, we've shown that iterated learning can uh, show promise as a mechanism to induce compositional structure in ML applications. Um, it is, helps us approach uh, the practical uh, neuromodular, uh, uh, neural uh, modular network program generation. Um, We'll see how far we can push that into the future, uh, but we're starting to see how we can get away with using relatively few programs, which is very promising. Uh, we, saw, we saw how seeded iterated learning, although be it quickly, but surprisingly uh, counters language drift, and this is the ICML paper that that's based on. And um, I think one thing I'd really like to call your attention to is that this idea of iterated learning and how it works is still somewhat mysterious to us. I think there is some theory I've mentioned earlier in this talk why I find that a little bit un, un, um, well, unsatisfying. Um, and uh, you know, look, we, we need help just exploring the kind of range of application we can actually apply this to and uh, promote this kind of systematic generalization that we're interested in. So this work was done in conjunction with uh, these people, so my students. Uh, here, and then uh, some collaborators at DeepMind and uh, Google Brain. All right, thanks. And again, I apologize for going uh, so much over. Thanks for those of you that stuck around. I guess if there's time for questions, I take questions now. Thanks, Alan. Uh, maybe we have time for one question or two questions at the max. Yes, Brendan. Hello, uh, and am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I've read this work before, but it's great to hear it from directly from you. Oh, um, I have wondered, have you looked at this, you know, you're talking about a learning bottleneck. And I'm wondering if you've kind of looked at this explicitly in terms of information theory, with ter in terms of like, because when you think of an idiosyncratic language, that's like very high entropy. And when you have something compositional, I, I'm, I think like the entropy kind of decreases. And so yeah. in a way like the iterated learning is kind of, we like to think that it's like imposing structure and maybe making things more complex, but in a way it's kind of making things less complex, but just in the right way, because you know, you can make it less complex, but then it would actually fail. So I've wondered if you explored that. Yeah. So, so we are beginning to explore things that way. I, I admit to being, a, I was initially a little bit skeptical that this was gonna offer a way of thinking about this. I actually have a, a fairly intuitive but uh, pretty basic kind of explanation for why this works. I think it's just that uh, compositional elements end up showing up a lot more frequently in the data just by their nature. Like idiosyncratic uh, features by their nature being idiosyncratic are, are, are very specific. And so they don't tend to show up that much in the data. So there's just more opportunities to train on these, um, on compositional elements. And so like, for example, just a real quick example, right? You've got, you imagine you have a red car feature, you have a red feature that just fires for everything red. 
and you have a, a car feature, right? You're going to see a car feature and the red feature a whole lot more frequently than you're going to see the red car feature. And so it's, those two are more likely to propagate through the stress of a learning bottleneck. Right. And so it's this iteration of, of promoting of these, these more common, more basic features that end up giving you the structure. That's, that's a, my hypothesis. Not all my students buy this hypothesis, but, but that's kind of my operating uh, sort of hypo theory at the moment. That being said, I do have a student that's actually looking at more of a, uh, a learning theory angle on this. And it's actually, he's kind of convinced me that this is actually a worthwhile direction to go. Uh, I won't, I mean, this is very much work in development, so I don't feel like I can talk very much about that um, in any kind of detail, but that we're starting to go that way, yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Other question? Okay, Alan, I can add one thing more to the mystery over here. Uh, Sure. You you can even, so my setup is almost similar, and you can even start the student model that you showed over there from random initialization, uh, and it works as well. The good thing if you do that is you can increase the capacity of that student model later on. Yeah, yeah. So so that that works very robustly actually. The 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 challenge for us was that you're saying if I go back, wait a few slides here. Uh, yeah, let's say. You're saying here. You're yeah. saying that uh, that this student you can initiate. You can start from random initialization. Yeah. Yeah. So so that is the sort of standard iterated learning framework, right? Yeah. That, and that that always works as far as I know. Um, the reason why we want to do this seated iterated learning, uh, I guess I didn't really make this that clear, is that it helps us shorten the amount of training we do in this context, right? Um, which is which in the case like when we apply these things to to um, the case of uh, Clever, for example. Clever has a large amount of data. And so we really wanted to be able to use something like this seated iterated learning because it would allow us to sort of short circuit a bunch of their, because every time having to retrain this on that much data, um, that's a long training process. So these models are big and that's a lot of data. So, so we would have liked to have been able to use this, but for whatever reason in that context, it, it wasn't able to be, it, it just didn't work nearly as well. So, so I agree that point from the efficiency perspective, but that also provides like high capacity models basically because you can now change from because you're not bound to what you initially trained, so you can absolutely on adding more and more capacities. Yeah, it's great. It's great, right? Like all you're transmitting is this data, right? So yeah, you yeah, can just yeah, put whatever yeah, model yeah. up there. Yeah, it's good. The, the, the beauty is that the observations of the model is contained within the labels or within the observations of the data itself, like the data that is being created in step two. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, sure. uh, I think there are no more questions. So we've already spent uh, taken a lot of time from Alan. Uh, yeah, well, thank, no, you. thank you. Sorry for taking all your time. No, 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 it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Let me stop. Really okay. uh,